That word comes from the New Revised Standard Version. We abbreviate it NRSV. There are weeks when our, our this, that's perhaps the most common text we use in our preaching here at Hope Now. Sometimes it's from the message. Sometimes we use the NIV, the New International Version. And one of the values of hearing different versions is sometimes it helps us to hear the text in a new way. So let me share with you another version of the text. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing on him to hear him, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. Noting that one of the boat owners was a homely shriveled man, Jesus then looked at the owner of the other boat. That man was Simon. He was strapping and a fine looking young man. So Jesus got into the boat belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. And he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, another boat containing Simon's fishing partners, James and John, came near. And Jesus said to the men in both boats, I need someone to put out into deep water and catch some fish. Simon immediately put up his hand and waved it eagerly and said, I'll do it, I'll do it, pick me. Whereupon Jesus selected Simon and told him to let down his nets and commence fishing for the Lord. This sounded all familiar? Some uh, strange twists, huh? It's an interesting piece. I, I stumbled across it, upon it because a person was reflecting on talking about this text with uh, other Christians and realizing that because of the different accounts of the call of the disciples and the stories of the fish, that, that the reality is, is that we kind of muddle all of the different Bible versions together and it kind of loses the distinctive edge and we miss some of the pieces. So, a starting place for us today as we encounter the good news from Luke is to admit or realize, confess, well, you could pick a verb, I guess, that this is one of those texts that we know so well, we kind of confuse it and muddle it together with the other accounts, uh, maybe perhaps create a kind of homogenized account of, uh, that's a syn- synopsis of what's in all of the different Gospels. But then also, many of us who grew up in the church could probably put one of those old flannel boards up and tell the story with those old felt pieces, right? Because we know the story so well. But when we do that, we miss some stuff. And so what I want to start with today is a little bit of teaching so that you can hear the the sharpness, the edge, the, the good news in the text. Because it's so easy to miss and focus in, I think, on some of the, the wrong, perhaps, parts of the text. First. In Luke, the call of the disciples comes later in Jesus' ministry. We're in chapter 5, and if you remember what we've done over the last couple of weeks, you know, Jesus was born, and we, we, we had that in chapter 2. In chapter 3, Jesus was baptized and tempted, and then he began to teach. And last week, we focused in on chapter 4, where Jesus returned to his hometown to teach. He read the prophet Isaiah. They're, they get so upset at his reading that they're ready to take him and throw him off of a cliff. And then Jesus continues teaching. He heals and he casts out demons. Notably, he heals Simon's mother-in-law. And then we come to the text. So Jesus' call of the disciples is a little bit later. A word is spread about who he is. Now, most scholars say that Jesus was likely... Uh, in and around the area where Simon was fishing for a while. So it's very likely that Simon not only knew Jesus because of his healing of his mother-in-law, but also because he probably heard Jesus teach, which shapes the interaction Jesus has with him when, when Jesus comes and asks to get in his boat. Now, Simon had been fishing at night. When we think of fishing, I think we think of taking a rod and reel casting. Maybe, maybe you think of trolling on Lake Erie where you just sit there. Fishing was not a relaxing, fun thing in Jesus' day. It was back-breaking labor. You had these boats and these heavy nets and you had to pull them down and manually pull them back up uh, when they were full of fish. And once you were done fishing, you had to pick out all the organic matter out of the nets, mend the nets and get them all cleaned up and ready to go so that you could fish again. And sometimes the fish run and sometimes they don't. Kind of like today where you see it, sometimes the fish bite and sometimes they don't. So they've been fishing all night long. They're exhausted. 
It's dangerous, dark out on the water, no, no lights like we would know. And they're just finishing up, ready to head home when Jesus comes. Can you imagine standing there and having Jesus say, well, can I get into your boat and just go off a little bit? Great. It's like that, that phone call you get at work at five minutes to five when you're ready to go home. You go, oh, should I answer it or not? And so Simon, knowing who Jesus was, okay, Jesus, let's get in the boat. And they go out just a little bit. And then Jesus asks to go out into deep water. Scholars say, by the way, there's, there's no evidence that deeper water meant a greater catch of fish, by the way. And Jesus asks them, uh, asks Simon for them to fish. Now, think for just a moment this experienced fisherman, what thoughts were running through his head. You know, Jesus, you're the rabbi, I'm the fisherman, they're not running tonight, I've been fishing all night. What are you thinking? But knowing who Jesus is a little bit, maybe not fully, we'll talk about that in a minute, he does what Jesus asks, and he puts the nets out. And the nets become full. As you homogenize the story, you know, the nets are so full that when they fill the boats that the boats begin to sink and they have to call over another boat to take some of the fish. Simon's response is really interesting. And that's one of the things we miss if you try and jumble the stories together, huh? When they have this miraculous catch of fish, uh, Simon Peter gets down on his knees and says, I... I'm a sinful man. We've heard that before. You heard it from the prophet Isaiah. You hear it in other places. Isaiah, uh, God brings a burning coal and puts it on Isaiah's mouth to, to purify him, to cleanse him of his sin. The interesting piece here is that's not how Jesus responds, by the way. Jesus never offers any uh, words of, of forgiveness. But why does Jesus, or why does Peter confess before Jesus his sin? Well, we focus in on the miraculous catch because you think about all of the fish and clearly God's intervening. You know, he, Simon Peter likely knew of Jesus' teaching and healing, but when the fish gets caught, it suddenly clicks for him in his head. This was a sign of the Messianic age, the Messianic banquet. Uh, maybe this one in the boat, this is the Messiah, the one God has sent, the one we've been praying for. Now remember how uh, the people in Jesus' day were anticipating the Messiah. They thought if there was just one moment where everybody across the face of the earth would refrain from sin, the Messiah would come. They thought that if two Sabbaths in a row were kept by the Jewish people, the Messiah would come. And here Peter is, and he realizes he's got the Messiah in his boat, and immediately he goes, oh, 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 I'm filled with sin. And he falls down at his knees. Now, the catch is pretty incredible. The problem with us is that we get caught up in that, that we don't catch the other miraculous parts of the text. How does Jesus respond to Peter and his confession of his sin? He says, come with me, follow me, and I will make you catch people. To get... The twist here. You have to understand discipleship and rabbinical teaching in Jesus' day. It started somewhere around age 10. Boys, different day, would begin studying with the rabbis. You were preparing for your uh, bar mitzvah, which was a coming of age, a becoming an adult. And how you prepared for your bar mitzvah was, you ready for this? You memorized the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Memorized. Because in the Hebrew, the only thing that was on the scrolls was the consonants. There were no vowels. And so when you got up to read, the consonant served as a mnemonic device so that you would be able to know what you, were, what you had memorized. It kind of helped you read it, right? And what would happen is the rabbis would work with these young boys, and, and if you got the, the first five books down great, they would say, you know, We'll keep going and, and give them some more of the prophets. If, if you only got the first five books down, you'd have your bar mitzvah, and they would say something like this. You know, you're really gifted, but you should probably go home and, and, and learn your father's trade. 
And then they would give you another section. If you were good enough to go on, you would learn the next section. The rabbi would keep watching you. And the rabbi would say, "Um, can this boy grow up and do what I do? Does he have it? And so each step along the way, there would be a calling. And those that weren't good enough would be home. Until finally, the the small number would, would ask, can I be your disciple? And the rabbi would say, you know, this kid's got it. This kid could do what I do and would receive that young man into his uh, uh, discipleship. Okay. Where was Simon when Jesus called him? He was home fishing. That means that through this process, he wasn't good enough. He didn't have it. The rabbis looked at him and said, go back and learn what your father does for a living. When he realizes he has the Messiah in his boat... Jesus doesn't say, I forgive you, when he announces his sinfulness. Jesus says, come and follow me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that is more incredible than the catch of fish. Jesus takes this one who is obviously not good enough and says, you're going to join me and be part of my work. Now, there's an interesting play on words here too. And unfortunately, in the English, we don't get it. It's kind of like you've all heard the story that Eskimos have uh, way more words for snow than we do. Well, there's more words for fish in the Greek than what we would say for fish. The word that's used here is very particular. It's only used two times in the New Testament. And it's a compound word, uh, so it's two words put together, and it connotes or denotes uh, catching fish alive by a net. It literally would be translated captured alive. Now you're going to say to me, oh yes, pastor, that makes sense. Jesus says you're going to be going out there and capturing people. And if you're capturing them dead, that's not going to do much good, right? But it even had more meaning than that. You know in Spanish, goodbye is adios, right? Which means go with God. You see the double meanings there? In the Greek, this word came to be known to restore to life and strength, or to revive. So when Jesus says to Simon, come, you're going to capture alive people, he's saying, you're going to join me in reviving the world. You're going to be restoring to life and strength. He offers words of forgiveness by saying, I've come to bring life, and you're going to be part of that. This one who was clearly not good enough to be a disciple of one of the rabbis. Now, this, and the twist here, is that the image of capturing people in a net was a very familiar image for for Jews. The prophets, Amos, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, all used that imagery of gathering the people up in a net in some of their uh, words of judgment, that that God would gather the people up into a net so that they could be judged for their sinfulness and their inability to keep the covenant. And Jesus comes and says, I'm here and you're coming along to gather people together, to capture them alive, not to judge them, but to bring life. Peter says, I'm a sinful man. And God says, come with me and we're going to bring life to the world. You know, to build on last week's sermon just a bit, you know, when we are baptized, we experience God's grace and call. You and I are not only invited, but we're expected to participate in this capturing alive of the people, of bringing life and strength, reviving the people of God for God. We become part of the group that God has gathered to restore life and strength to a broken and sinful world. The temptation, of course, is to respond like Simon, right? You know, not me, God. I, I, I can't do that. I'm sinful. But instead, God says, yes, you. I'm reviving you. I am giving you life. You are forgiven. And now you join my team. And you will be sharing that life with the world. I think it's an important message for us to get because it really captures what it means to be part of the people of God. One of the great childhood memories was of my 
my father and his sister, my Aunt Ruth. And I share lots of stories about her. Deep woman of faith. My father and his family didn't grow up in the church. My aunt made her way to a Baptist church has become vibrant in her faith life uh, to this day. My dad came to faith really through my mom and was baptized when my younger sister was baptized. Uh, went on a, a Via de Cristo weekend, a Crucio weekend, and for him, he grasped the grace of God and realized that we were called to be out there to share that, that life and love. And my aunt was much more of a heavy-handed kind of uh, message. And I'll never forget them arguing one day she accused my father of loving people straight into hell. And he said, you're not going to scare people into heaven. <laughs> and I remember them arguing back and forth about grace. Huh? We are called to be people who carry God's grace. To be the net that God uses to share that good news with the world. We as the church are about being life-giving. Now's when the story about the catch becomes central. It's not about this abundance of fish just by itself. I mean, we get caught up in that miracle. And that really, at the beginning of the story, points to the end of the story. Because you see what happens when we respond to the call by Jesus to be about sharing life and love and hope and strength. Literally good news. The promise is that we will be bursting at the seams. And I don't know if it is that the church hasn't heard the call or if we've denied the call or whether we've misunderstood what it means to be about catching or capturing people. But Jesus has promised that when we embrace our task, not only are we sharing life and love, but that we'll have a catch of undeniable proportions. Last night I got to hear uh, Dr. Martin Marty speak. He was... Uh, brought in for a lecture series at Sylvania UCC. Dr. Marty is one of the preeminent scholars on culture and church. He's a retired professor emeritus from the University of Chicago. He's done 60, 65 volumes now of work. And one of the things he pointed out was that right now, the number of Christians on the face of the earth is actually growing. Not in the United States. And actually, worship attendance is growing mostly because of the number of converts and those participating in Africa. And he shared some of that growth. It reminded me of a people who hasn't lost sight of that call. One of the challenges you and I face, one of the edgy parts of this text, is the recognition that we have been captured, but we're captured so that just like Simon Peter, we might be used, even in the midst of our sinfulness, for the sake of the kingdom. And that God forgives us for the sake of the world, for our sake, but also so that we might be those who go out and participate in the incredible harvest. Amen.